Good morning. So this is going to be my first video, hopefully in a lot of live videos that I'm going to be doing for my first vegetable gardener. So I can see some of you I know, hello, and I know you've been gardening for a while. So this live series is really focused on somebody who wants to start their garden for the first time. So I'm going to really slowly go over all the basic information, starting with today's live event, which is kind of picking the site and some basic information you want to know before you start building your garden. So we will get started. It's uh, 12 o'clock. We'll wait a couple of minutes. If you're going to be watching this after the live event, just kind of click forward a little bit till the video starts. But we're going to go over today, building, starting your first vegetable garden, um, just the basic ideas of what you want in place. And then I have a list of 20 about 20 points that I want to make. So I think it will be helpful. I also like doing this because in the live format, you can answer questions um, or ask questions right away and I can answer them. But I'd like these questions to be kind of focused on the topic. And it's really today starting your first vegetable garden. So as we wait a couple of minutes for more people to sign in, um, feel free to throw out the questions. I suspect since this is my first live on this channel um there's and i have two youtube channels i have the rusted garden which has almost seven hundred thousand subscribers and this one has my first vegetable garden has about i don't know one hundred and twenty thousand subscribers so i think this group is going to be small to start but if it catches on the chat should get bigger and bigger so when you do have a question just put question in front of it so i can kind of answer it with um easier pulling it out of there so as we wait, we'll get started. Let's say we'll get started at 12.05. That's in five minutes. Um, throw out a question. So Ruth, I was uh, just watching an old lavender seed growing video you did five years ago. Or no, oh, you're just making a statement. <laughs> I thought you had a question. So I have been doing this for a long time between two channels. And the beauty about gardening is there's a thousand ways to get to you know, a great harvest. So some of my older videos, tried and true, as you go to newer videos, I change them a little bit, but gardening techniques really haven't changed for hundreds of years. I mean, you know, not much changes. The earth is kind of, and nature takes care of the earth. We learn how to plant, we learn how to tend, we learn how to grow food. One of the things I'll be covering on here is not to go and think you have to spend money on everything that's stamped organic. Organic gardening kind of got crazy commercial with you know the commercialized world. And there's a lot of high-priced products out there, lots of things that say organic, natural, etc. They're not necessarily bad, but they're really, really expensive. And you don't need the expensive stuff to grow vegetables. You really only, or flowers or herbs, you really just need compost. And maybe a water-soluble fertilizer and a dry organic granular fertilizer that's fairly inexpensive. So one of the things, if you want to subscribe and follow me for my first vegetable garden, I'll be going going over like budget considerations, um, telling you what products really are too much. And I'm never probably going to say they don't work. They all work, but you just don't have to spend a lot of money. So three more minutes, we'll get started. Kay has a question. I'm thinking about using T-Posts and the PVC um, T at the end. I use EMT conduit running through it. The bed is 80 inches long. Do you think I need a bracing in the middle for tomatoes? Let me just picture it in my head. So <laughs> I was trying to kind of visualize it. I'm not sure, you know, a T-post, you can buy up to eight to 10 feet and they can kind of get a little bit expensive, six or $8, but a T-post, maybe 10, if you're getting one really big, they're going to last forever. If you're using the PVC, if you're at, you know, half inch really makes a difference between three quarters of an inch and then conduit in the middle would strengthen it up. The tomato plant can get to easily 40, 50 pounds when it's six, seven feet tall, loaded with tomatoes. So I, I don't know to answer your question, 
without seeing kind of visually seeing how strong it is. But if you can go over to it and you can easily bend it over, it's, it's too, it's not strong enough. You're going to have to be able to, you know, kind of tug on it with some force um, so that it doesn't bend all the way over. Now you might be designing something that wobbles a little bit. That's going to work, but I'm just not sure without kind of seeing it. So, I'll answer this question, then we'll just get started. And I'll be doing like, so this live series for new gardeners, I'll have a topic. Um, the best way to find this is to subscribe, turn on notifications. I'm not always going to be able to do this at a set time. I'm going to squeeze it into other things that I'm doing on my other main channel and kind of when I have time. We will definitely be talking about water-soluble fertilizers, um, organic granular fertilizers, what the numbers mean. Like you, you're buying a 10, 12, 12 fertilizer, which means it has 10% nitrogen, 12% phosphorus, 12% um, potassium, the main fertilizers. That's a good fertilizer. It's kind of high. It's not going to hurt anything. But when you buy the fertilizers, you're really looking at the cost. And at a 10, 12, 12, that's probably not an organic fertilizer, which is okay. Um, I am mostly organic. You can use any type of fertilizer, chemical or organic. Everything's a chemical, in fact. But when we say chemical fertilizers, we mean fertilizers that are processed in some way by scientists and people. Your garden soil is not going to be able to really thrive and live off of 10, 12, 12 fertilizer or any kind of fertilizer. You have to get to composting. And I'll be talking about that. You can use that fertilizer. I always say use a fertilizer that's around a 5, 5, 5 NP and K. You just don't need that much. So you can cut the dosing down by half, in my opinion. It will last longer, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can use it. Um, as a new gardener, most important about these numbers, don't worry about them. You're going to hear so much information about increasing phosphorus, increasing nitrogen. At this point, change your fertilizer over to a higher phosphorus for your pepper plants when they're in bloom. That's fine if you want to learn all about that. But as a new gardener, it's taking care of the soil, getting the sun, getting started, and we'll cover more in depth about the fertilizer. All right, so let's get started. Yeah, so um, Stacy, Urban Chicken Mama, who also is a perk member that I have on my other channel. Yeah, you cut strong fertilizer just by looking. So if it says one cup across... I don't know, 100 square feet, let's just say. You would just cut it in half to a half a cup, and that reduces it. The thing about the ratios that get re really confusing is when you're scattering it throughout your garden, you're decreasing that ratio by a whole lot. So when you follow the instructions, it doesn't mean you've increased your garden coverage by 10% nitrogen. You've just increased it a little bit. And just kind of foreshadowing for future lives, Compost is well below a 111 NP and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Just regular compost works. So you don't have to over worry about all these numbers. Easiest vegetable to grow, that varies, but I will be going over the five, six vegetables for the cool weather and warm weather in this live for what I would recommend for new gardeners. So let's just get started. I'm in Maryland zone seven. Um, zones are only really used by North America. You don't have to pin yourself to the zone. It helps give you an idea of what's growing. So if you're in a similar place like Maryland, you can follow me along and, you know, see how things are growing. Most important thing. And again, this is always going to be focused as you're just getting started. Start small. It's really easy, well, two things. It's really easy to spend a lot of time thinking you have to know everything, um, watching videos, certainly please watch some of mine, but you don't have to overwatch videos. You don't have to overread, you don't have to overlearn. And that's what I'm gonna bring to you all through this channel is basic information to get you started. You're gonna learn the best. And I know that you're gonna be successful because even if you fail 50%, you're still going to get 50% of great harvest and you're going to enjoy it. So by getting out there and doing, that's how you're going to learn. And that's how, and every year I'm still learning after 30, 40 years, you're going to improve your skills. 
So first thing is, is don't overthink it. Don't over worry. Don't think you have to be perfect. Gardens are forgiving. Nature is forgiving. Plants want to grow. Um, you know, just get started. That's the biggest barrier is getting that shovel into the ground and starting your garden. The other thing is to start small. It's real easy too to go the opposite end. You build, you know, six four by eight raised beds. You build some other things. Everything's going great when it's cool. Things are small. Then all of a sudden you have massive plants, all kinds of stuff going on. You get insects and diseases coming in. Don't get overwhelmed by that. But if you start small, you can slowly learn how to take care of all these things. And again, as I'm going through these, and I'm only going to be on, you know, for about an hour at the most. Um, if you have a question and I miss it, just throw it back down there later on. So number two, with respect to the first one, plants are going to get really large. So don't overplant. When you first start out and you're buying tiny tomato plants, you may put them like right next to each other. You might squeeze in a squash plant. Everything looks beautiful. Little tiny baby plants. And then all of a sudden your tomato plants are three, four feet wide, seven feet tall. Your squash plant is giant. You've overplanted. Things are smothering each other. You've planted them in the wrong way. You put the tomatoes in the front. They're casting shade. So just remember, plants will get large. When you're first starting, give them more space than you think. I'll be going over that. Like we'll be doing planting warm crops or planting tomatoes, for example, in this live series. Also, if you go to my channel, My First Vegetable Garden, and look in the video description, I have a whole selection of how to start seeds indoors, and I have lots of videos that will supplement what I'm talking about. All right. The sun, that's the biggest question. You're going to read that, yes, yeah, some plants can manage with four to six hours of sun. And yes, you can garden with six hours of sun. You can, but what they don't tell you is six hours of full afternoon sun, like 12 to 6 p.m., is very different than sun 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So if you have really intense sun, 11 to 6 o'clock at night, not quite eight hours, you should be okay. But I want you to kind of figure this out as you want eight hours of direct sun, meaning not just bright light, but the sun rays actually hit your garden spot. The way you figure that out is you walk your property, find where you want to grow, and you go out there at like 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 p.m., 4 p.m., 6 p.m., and you check, is the sun hitting your space? And you just record the hours that it's covering it, and at the end, you total it up, and you want eight hours. More is fine, but eight hours really makes a big difference. Makes a difference for how the soil dries, how the soil warms, how well the plants do. You can, you know, kind of split hairs when it comes to sun, but eight hours is where I would start. You're also gonna need a plan too about the pests. So some of you may wanna start in containers. I'll talk a little bit about that. If you're starting in the ground, um, in your yard, you may have deer, you may have rabbits. So you have to work that into the equation. If they are present, they will chew your garden and you can fence, you know, lower fencing for rabbits. You can do four foot fencing for deer. Um, you have to put, you know, and I use my garden is set up with kind of wood slats, three of them, but I have wiring on there to keep the rabbits out, to keep groundhogs out, etc. So you do have to have a plan for deer. Now, you don't need a 10-foot, 12-foot tall fence for deer. The trick with deer is you kind of make your space and you build along the inside of that garden where the fence is. Deer don't want to jump over and land onto something that's going to break their feet. So sometimes people think they need huge fences to keep out deer. If there's a, I guess it'd be a famine <laughs> for deer and they're starving, they will risk more jumping into your garden. But if your garden's full of like trellises and beds, they don't really want to jump in there. So you don't need a massive fence, but you're going to have to think about that for um, issues with, you know, animals. Soil, that's the next thing I want to cover because that's where people spend a fortune. If you walk out into your space and you see grass growing, weeds growing, flowers growing, plants growing, you don't need to over amend your soil. You don't need to bring in expensive soil by the truckload or you can pay more money by going to like Home Depot and Lowe's and buying bags and bags of expensive stuff and make this perfect soil. The truth is your plants grow 
really in that top six or eight inches of the soil. They put out surface roots. Whatever you have below it, the deep roots get into there. My soil is clay. You know, they get into there. They get great nutrients out of clay, by the way. You don't have to like dig down. Some people think you have to have like two feet of this best stuff down in the earth. You don't. You just need to have the top couple of inches ready to go. And you can do that slowly over the years. And I'll be talking about compost shortly and how that relates to being a first time gardener, the importance of that. The next question I get, so we have sun, we have soil, um, is watering. And people always ask, how often do I have to water? And the truth is, without being kind of rude, is you have to water as often as is needed by the plant. And you have to learn about that a little bit. And it's not hard to kind of figure it out. I will help you with that if you want to follow me. So for instance, when the soil temperatures are cooler, when the day temperatures are cooler and the plants are smaller, you water less frequently. As summer rolls in, everything heats up, your plants are large, you're gonna to have to water more frequently. And that's true for any earth and that's true for your containers. So there's never a way to say every week, water one inch worth of water around your plants. Watering, and over the years I learned is most important. You, you don't want, like plants will survive out in the garden with one or two inches every week. And that's what you hear a lot. But they're gonna thrive being watered three or four times a week. One deep watering, but watering that top six, eight inches that I was talking about. That's a difference between a plant that might be like this wide and four feet tall to a plant that's a little bit wider, six feet tall and is producing more. The moisture helps them have the perfect conditions to pull in the fertilizer. And that's why watering is important. And in case you missed that, when we put in fertilizer, um, compost, bag stuff, dried, water soluble, the only way a plant can pull in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, other nutrients is to have moisture. Moisture pulls that in through the root systems, then it gets delivered through the plant. So if you're not watering enough, everything kind of slows down. Yes, the plants will survive, but they're not able to access everything that's in your soil the best. Now, that doesn't mean you're out there watering every day. Um, it just means you're figuring out the right amount to put in um, into the garden. And, you know, you learn how to do that. That's going to be learned over time. The other thing about watering real quick is I'm in Maryland. And last year, we didn't have as much rain, but we get lots of rain here. So if you're getting lots of rain, and that means a good inch or two falling over 24 hours, 48 hours, you have to water less. If you're in a place that gets less water, you have to stay up on it. Um, and then compost. This is kind of point number seven. Before people get started, they very often are excited, which I get. They build the garden, they get planting, and they never get to the compost bin. And a compost bin can just be four posts, four feet apart, fencing wrapped around it, and you just dump in your leaves and your cut grass. If you're using cut grass, make sure you're not spraying chemicals on there. And you just let it sit. Even if it takes two years to break down into this beautiful stuff, two years from now, you're gonna have a ton of compost. And that's what you start layering into your garden, replaces the organic fertilizers, your garden begins to thrive and do better because you're just creating better soil. But you have time. You don't have to go out and buy, you know, I don't even know how it would come. I guess cubic feet, but you don't have to, let's just say, 200 pounds of compost and spread it through your yard. You don't have to have a truck come in and dump, you know, a couple cubic yards down. You can do that if you want and you have the budget, but you can go slowly and just build a beautiful garden over time. All right, so I'm going to turn my page here and I'm going to answer some questions. The easiest vegetable to grow, I said, we'll get to that. Um, Krista, do peppers and tomatoes produce well in the original green stalks, trying to save space? Yes, so growing vertically is something I'm going to mention. That's something you want to put into your design plan. Tomatoes won't, like your indeterminate tomatoes that get six, seven, eight feet won't. But determinate tomatoes grow very well in the green stalks. And I've grown, um, I don't know, 18, 20 peppers in a full green stalk tower. That's a tower of five tiers, five pockets. When you put in bigger plants, the only thing is that you just have to fertilize a little bit more mid-season with a water soluble and water more regularly. But peppers definitely grow in there.
So the sweet peppers, um, Denise is asking, and again, throw a question in front of there. When would she start them? Her last frost date is April. I go back from the last frost date real quick, and then I go back 10 weeks, and that's when I would start my peppers. And again, if you check out the video description here, I have links to um, how to start seeds indoors. And I also have a video, if you go to the channel, um, on when to start my pepper plants indoors, to be honest with you. I just did that. All right, so let's go to the next part. So garden size, when people are first getting started and they're like, well, how big should I make it? If you wanna kind of go all in with a fence in a space, I would start with 15 feet by 15 feet, 20 feet by 20 feet. When you're buying fencing, it comes in sections. It might be eight foot sections. So it's always easier to build in the sections that fencing comes, unless you're having it you know, built specifically. So 16 by 16 or 24 by 24 with a gate, that's plenty of size to kind of grow into, literally. And you don't necessarily have to plant all of it, but it will give you the opportunity to have a space that if you love gardening, you'll be able to grow in there a whole lot. That being said, um, you can also start without a fence if you don't have animal pressure. And that can be really whatever you want. What I would recommend, say maybe you're a couple of two, um, two, four by eight raised beds. That's enough to get started. You can grow a lot of plants in there. If you're a family of four and you kind of want to feed your kids, maybe three or four, four by eight raised beds to get started. And that's four feet by eight feet. You can buy them. You can make them. You don't have to spend the money on framing beds. You can just plant in the ground. One of the best ways to grow is just to mound up three feet across as long as you want. You know, if you want a 16 foot row, three feet across, and you would just plant in that. So you don't have to spend money on a construction. It's hard for me to say, you know, how big the garden should be, but you want to start smaller kind of in the parameters that I said, and then come from there. All right. Next thing that gets really confusing is organic gardening at its core was sourcing what you need from around your property and then your community and making compost. And then knowing what you're spraying on your plants that you're not putting on human made chemicals that you don't know what they do. Over the last 10, 15 years, it's become to the point where people are afraid to use the chemical fertilizers. They don't hurt your plants. They're afraid to use some sort of spray that's been around for 60 years. They think they have to go and buy every product has to have a stamp that says organic or they're doing something wrong. You're not. If that's how you want to go, that's fine. But by looking solely for organic stamped products, you're spending a lot of money that you don't have to. For instance, the best example I can give you, and it kind of makes sense is when you buy seeds, unless they're sprayed with a chemical, which they have done in the past, then they might be pink or green, and that's a fungicide, and it will say on there, throw those out. Every other seed, just because it's not stamped organic, doesn't mean it's problematic. It's almost the same exact seeds. A lot of times, it's the same exact seeds. In order to put an organic stamp on it, you have to kind of get, you know, a stamp of approval. There's nothing different with those seeds. It's it's it gets to be kind of silly. But you some people are paying 50 cents or even a dollar more a pack just because it says organic. And when you think that you're not paying more, the quantity of seeds in there is less than just a plain old stamp or plain old pack of seeds. So think about it. It doesn't have to say organic. The other tip on there is people started freaking out that they were growing genetically modified organisms, gen genetically modified seeds. One seed company got the idea of, I'm going to put on there non-GMO. Seeds in a seed pack will never be GMO, ever. It's a big business. Tons of money are spent on it. But then when people saw non-GMO in this pack of seeds, and this one didn't have it, everybody started spending money on the non-GMO pack. So don't get caught in the label game and pay more money. You want to learn what the products are ingredient-wise, 
and you want to learn where they come from. And I hope that helps you save some money down the line. Um, lady says, should we buy compost bins? What's the best way to get, or I guess, make a compost bin? I see a few online. So the best way is if you have space. Um, I have videos on this on my different channels, but you basically get six foot T posts or stakes or sticks from the woods. And you just do four feet by four feet, put them in as the corners. You wrap four foot fencing around there. You can buy the cheap stuff at the big box stores. Just open up the front close the front, whatever, squeeze it together, fill that bin full of leaves and grass and leaves and grass and let it break down. That is the cheapest way to do it. Always works. You don't need to do anything special to it. You don't need to do crazy turning. That will help speed it up if you want when you manage greens and browns and carbons and nitrogen and stuff, but that's for another class. Just get that pile started and it, it, it's going to work for you. All right. So where are we at? We're at 10, uh, 1224. So again, just put your questions out with the with a question in front of your statement. Earth beds. Um, I just want to be clear again. You're going to see, like in my garden, I built wooden raised beds. I have metal raised beds. I use repurposed fire rings. That can get expensive. You don't have to start with that. And maybe you want to save spending money till you know if you really like vegetable gardening. So the earth beds, as I was saying, just three feet across, mound it up a little bit, you know, as long as you want, eight feet, 12 feet, 16 feet. If you're doing multiple rows, you always want three feet in between your rows or at least three feet in between your beds so that you can move wheelbarrows through them so you can walk through them. But you can just start in the earth. You don't need anything fancy. Let me just take a second and... Check to see what I've covered here. All right. So if you're first getting started, um, you're looking at planting based on cool weather crops and warm weather crops. Cool weather crops in general, and there's a lot of them. I can't list them all today. They can take a frost. They prefer cooler soil, cooler temperatures. Your warm weather crops like warmer soil, and they can't take a frost. A frost will actually kill them. So for cool weather crops, for stuff that you would plant in your spring, when frost is going away, sometimes it might pop up. The night temperatures are staying around the 40s. You know, sometimes a drop in the 30s, fine. But they're going from freezing winter to kind of warming, so to speak, to, you know, early spring temperatures. What I recommend for new gardeners are just starting with radishes, peas, lettuce, spinach, kale, and collards. So Lettuce, spinach, kale, and collards are more of your leafy greens, great for making salads. They are hardy. They grow nicely. Radishes are pretty much easy to grow. And then peas are always fun to grow. If you want to add something into that, um, purple top turnips grow really well. And turnips have a good taste to them. You could even add in beets. But as you're adding in more and more, it gets a little bit more complicated with care and tending. So the main five, radishes, peas, lettuce, spinach, kale, and collards. And then if you want to throw in two more, turnips and beets. That's plenty to kind of get started. And you don't want to plant like six kale plants. They get kind of big. Collards get big. If it's just two of you, you're not going to eat them all. You're better off planting two kale plants or two collard plants, taking care of them well, than trying to tend six or eight of them because you overplanted. Krista, rodents and compost. What are your recommendations regarding keeping critters out of the compost and out of the garden for that matter? So you can't. So if you're not putting in meat products and stuff like that, you're not going to get super problematic rodents. Now, if you're in a city, greater chance because there's a higher population, sadly, of rats and mice. They're going to show up no matter what. You can't keep them out. Out of my property, um, we have snakes around at times. We have hawks around. They kind of manage things pretty well. The key with compost is if it's kind of in an open place and you can have your compost getting sun, it can be, you know, in the shady air if you want. But if you put down tarps, tarps create a great environment for mice and voles and moles to kind of live. Don't use the tarps. That keeps the space open, keeps the rodents away, 
and your stuff still breaks down. Or if you're going to use a tarp to keep in moisture for whatever reason, you want to disturb that several times during the week so that they don't set up. In your garden, you know, people, if you have um, moles or you have voles, they show up, mice, they show up, but not as much as you think. Um, the biggest problem I hear are really cats coming into a garden from around the neighborhood. Um, I have squirrels. I have to trap them and release them. Um, but I, I don't want you to panic because part of starting your first garden is to take notes on what actually shows up and what becomes a problem. If you start reading about all the issues, it's going to scare you and you're not going to get started because you're going to think every disease is going to show up, every insect is going to show up, and every you know, rodent or problem is going to show up. For warm crops and in Maryland, so for the cool crops in Maryland, I plant starting middle of March all the way through April, and then I stop planting them. In May, I start getting into warm crops. The warm crops I recommend are tomatoes, peppers, zucchini, cucumbers, and green beans. That's five of the main standards that we buy. If you've never grown a cucumber and pick it, picked it off the vine, you don't know what you're missing. You cut it, it seeps, it smells like cucumber, it's full of moisture, very different than the cucumber you buy at the grocery store in smell, in taste, in beauty in general. Tomatoes have an amazing taste to them. Peppers, same thing. Because you're picking right from the plant and eating them, they are full of moisture, they're full of sugars. Once plants are picked, they begin to dehydrate and a lot of their sugars convert to starches. So part of what you're doing is just getting tastier and better produce out of your garden. Doesn't mean what you buy at the grocery store isn't full of nutrients, but the garden I think is better. All right, so let's go over to the next part. If you're gonna build your raised beds, um, sometimes and people like to do that. You just get wood, build your raised beds. They can be edges or sides that are six inches or eight inches. I call them more framed beds. Those are nice because you can frame out where you're putting your soil or where you're putting your bed, drop it on the ground, and then you're filling that up with the better stuff. That's where all your compost will be going when you're making it. And the plants are gonna really thrive in that six or eight inches and they're gonna grow into the soil. And there's lots of ways to set that up. That's beyond today's scope. But when you're building the four by eight raised beds or when you're building the raised beds, I gave it away, you want them to be not more than four feet wide. Your arms are two feet. You don't wanna step into your raised bed or your framed bed, that's part of the benefit. But with your two foot arms, you can walk around it, reach into the bed, plant and tend it. So you never want a raised bed that you're building to be greater than four feet, or you're gonna have to step into it to tend it. And that kind of you know, rem removes one of the benefits of having a raised bed. April, in central New York, we barely have any snow this year and the ground isn't frozen. Can I throw fruits? food scraps and eggs in the soil. The compost bin is better. Um, Eggshells, first of all, take forever to break down. I would just grind them up and scatter them around and over the years, the eggs will give back. Food scraps, if it's vegetable matter and stuff like that, that's fine. It's gonna mostly probably dry, become brittle, get mixed into the soil, um, but it's not gonna do anything huge for you. It's not gonna hurt you, it's not gonna be the, it, it's not really going to be compost. It'll be just kind of scraps you threw in there. Um, if you put them into a bin or, well, a bin, let me rephrase it. A pen is kind of open fencing and stuff like that. I call it a bin sometimes. I just want to be clear. You don't have to put it into a clear tumbler or anything like that, or I'm sorry, a plastic tumbler or a sealed container. You can just throw it into a pile in a bin. And as that pile gets built up, when this matter breaks down, it kind of warms up and helps speed up the breakdown process and you get different microbes coming in and it really speeds up things. When you're scattering it on your bed, um, it's not really getting that benefit. It will eventually get incorporated into the soil, but it's up to you. One of the cool things too, I mean, just as a side note, is sometimes people dig a hole, like a two foot hole in the center of their garden bed. And that's where they throw all the scraps, you know, through the winter and they cover it over and they just let that sit there for the summer and worms will get in there and kind of distribute it. But that's that's a whole different way to, to compost, which works too. Um, I mentioned this already. If you're building and setting up rows and you're setting up raised beds or metal beds, make sure you leave at least three feet 
are enough space for you to be able to move a wheelbarrow down there so that you get around and move through your garden. If you're going to um, grow in containers, you can, you have to keep in mind how big the plants get. So you want to start tomatoes um, in 10, 20 gallon containers. Their plants get really big. The roots get really big. Same with squash, cucumbers, peppers can go into maybe the 10 gallon container. The smaller the container, the faster the root system is going to fill that up. The faster it's going to take nutrients out, the faster it's going to take water out. So we have a tendency to start in these really small pots because your tomato plant's only this big, where your pepper plant looks something like this. When they get to size, the containers are too small. It's really a pain to thin pot them up. So if you're gonna go with the way of the container garden, I would recommend looking at 10, 20 gallon containers for your plants. And with time through this series and on my channel, you can learn what to plant and what size container. All right, just to, I, I'm on well water, so I have a hose. Yeah, <laughs> I have a hose. Everybody has a hose, <clears throat> reaches out there. But if I went much further beyond my garden, the water pressure, the water pressure slows down a little bit. So you just wanna make sure where you place your garden that the hose can reach it easily um, that you have water pressure to water your garden and it's just kind of a quick check. Some of us have larger properties and the, the gardens get put out further, but then all of a sudden you're like, you have to buy extra hose. You've got to coil all this hose. So you just want to figure out a watering strategy. If you want to set up automated watering systems and stuff like that, I don't do that. I would search online to see what's the best way to do it. But being a first time gardener, starting with a couple small beds, smaller space, watering's not really an issue until you get to a garden with a good size to it. And I want to stress again, use leaves and grass as much as you can for compost. Make sure there's no sprays on your lawn. Um, every time you cut the grass, throw the grass into a bin. When you pile up grass a whole lot, it does kind of start to smell because the ammonia and the breakdown, if you want, fluff it up a couple of every couple of days, mix it into your leaves. Um, you might have to do a little bit of grass. Either way, it's going to break down into beautiful compost. And what I'm suggesting now is don't over worry about how to make compost until you've got that bin set up and you're using it regularly. Once you have your pen set up and you're putting compost in, you can learn ways to manage any odor that builds up if you put in too much grass, ways to kind of mix the carbons, the leaves, the greens of the grass, heat it up to temperatures of like 120 degrees, it breaks down really fast. The biggest barrier is people just don't build the pens and they never get composting. Or they spend all this time learning about how to do it, it becomes a barrier, they don't get started. So get that pen started first. All right, so let's just pause here. We got time. I've got about five more points, um, and then I'll, you know, certainly take questions after that. It's a lot, you know, and part of why I wanted to start this series with kind of an overview is to help people kind of get through that barrier of being overwhelmed. You know, if you can get into the air, you can start growing. You're going to figure out whether or not you like it. I've not heard anybody not like it. Um, and then you expand from there, really. And that kind of comes to the don't overthink it. And, and I am aware, too, you know, this is the first time that I'm doing this live event. And I think, you know, the more that I do, the more people that will be signing on, the more questions we'll get and stuff like that. Don't overthink gardening. The other thing that happens is, is you're going to start reading that you need specialized fer uh, specialized fertilizers. You absolutely, absolutely don't. We're going to do a whole series on fertilizers. Um, <laughs> I don't know why that word's hard for me to say. Fertilizers um, on this live meth, uh, format. You just need nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. When you look at the organic dry 
granular fertilizers. And if you can buy organic, that's great. Just don't overpay. Some per pound, they're like under $2 a pound. That's okay. Sometimes they're like 4 or $5 a pound. That's crazy. When you read the ingredients, most of the time it's chicken manure, ground up feathers, ground up bone, dried blood, and then some other stuff. And it's the same throughout all the fertilizers. You're going to see that this fertilizer has um, a, a fungi in it and it has this different bacteria and these microbes. That's already out in your garden. That's nice stuff to have sometimes to help your containers go a little bit, but you don't need to buy it. You know, unfortunately, it's like toothpaste. Toothpaste has to be like super white, triple white, platinum white, you know, foaming, activating, whatever. I mean, it, they just start throwing all these things onto the toothpaste to make it sound different than the other toothpaste. And we've been using toothpaste for 40 years. It's not much different. Same with the fertilizers. So buy what you like, but don't be fooled by all this fancy packaging and stuff like that. General rule of thumb, if you're buying the organic granular, which is dry fertilizers, and they're organic, $2 or less per pound. Um, then you have your water-soluble fertilizers, miracle Grow, which people don't like that company, then buy Plant Expert. But those water-soluble chemical types are effective, but they don't you don't use them to support your soil life. You're going to be using your compost. And that's why they get a bad rap. People are like, well, if you use the chemical fertilizers all the time, you're killing everything. Well, I guess you would, but don't do that. <laughs> Give them a splash to get them started. Chemical fertilizers are fine if you're on a budget. Compost is king or queen. If you get enough compost going, you don't need to buy the organic fertilizers and you don't need to buy you know, any of the fertilizers really. Maybe just a water soluble for when you plant a plant, get them started. That's for the earth. In containers, you have to fertilize a little bit differently. We'll talk about that in future series. Seven dust I will use. I've researched it. I don't, I, and basically I understand what the chemical is in it. Um, you can use Captain Jack's dead bug dust. That's organic. That works too. I use seven, seven dust in a very specific way on a base of a plant away from flowers on crops that are easy to wash or won't touch it. And it, it kills vine borers and other problematic insects. And that's what I teach and recommend is use whatever you want, um, but use it in a way that makes sense. Like I would never take seven dust and throw it everywhere. It's going to kill everything. Good insects, bad insects, pollinators. Now, I know how to use it. I don't mind using it, but it's true with the organic dust. So Captain Jack's dead bug dead bug dust has spinosad in it. That's the organic component. It is organic, but it also kills everything. So if I took my spinosad and sprinkled it everywhere, it's going to kill every insect. So organic doesn't mean safe to insects and pollinators and bees. It just means it falls into a different category. And it's more for us to understand what it is. So, you know, what I recommend is learn the products, you know, um, and understand them and figure out how you might use it. For instance, I wouldn't put any dusts on lettuce and spinach because it's too hard to wash and I don't want to be eating anything. But on a pumpkin patch where the pumpkins are easy to wash or I'm cutting into it, I might use the seven dust. I use Captain Jack's. I use Spinoset a lot. But I'm just to answer the question, you know, you want to know what the products do. I've been using Alaska fish fertilizer for three years now for everything on my garden. Amen. What are your thoughts? I like it. So I used Alaskan um, fish fertilizer. It's great. It's got like a five nitrogen, a one in, a one nitrogen, or yeah, five nitrogen, one potassium, one phosphorus, a five, one, one NP and K. <clears throat> I actually use AgroThrive now. And I'm affiliated with them. And it's an organic fertilizer. It's more like a 422. It doesn't smell like fish fertilizer. And it's great stuff. I like it. I'm using that. So the options that I recommend are um, fish fertilizer, Alaskan brand is good, or Agro Thrive. And I don't know if I have them attached to the video, de to the description of this video, but I am affiliated with them. And if it's in there, you can get a discount for it, but it's a great water-soluble fertilizer. Once you have plenty of compost, I do recommend like 
fish emulsion as your water soluble, AgroThrive as your water soluble. Use the chemical types that works too. And this one is a little bit hard to explain, but you're going to be reading that you need a specialized fertilizing schedule, like more nitrogen, you know, at planting, more phosphorus midway through, you know, add potassium if you want more flowers. You don't have to worry about that. That is true, and it's more important. I think for hydroponics, for farming, for more industrial gardening than your home garden. Your home garden. You want to get to the point where you've got good soil. doesn't have to be great. You're using your water soluble. When you plant, you give it some organic granular, compost if you have it. Get your plant set up. It's growing. Mid-season, you put down more compost, maybe some water soluble fertilizer. Hit it with what you have. Your plants are going to grow. You don't have to start worrying about the ratios of N, P, and K. Down the line, maybe you want to learn more about that. And then uh, for the, I'm down to the last two. For growing uh, vertically, creating some um, trellising, the Greenstock Garden Towers, I'm also affiliated with them, but they should be in the video description. You can grow in the vertical towers. They do really well. But trellising is a great way to kind of lift the plants up, go vertically, and it gives you more space for growing. You may just want to, tr you know, build one trellis here. Um, you can trellis up poles. You can take a bunch of tree branches, make a teepee, grow beans up them. There's all kinds of different things you can do. But you don't have to, again, overspend on very complicated trellises. The plants don't care what they grow up or what they grow on. And then finally, planting. And, you know, if you want to follow me on this channel and for this series, and again, subscribe because you need to be, you need to subscribe to be able to ask questions. Um, and if you subscribe, you'll get notifications of when, I, when I'm doing these. So when you do get to planting, you also, like when you're checking to figure out, you know, when is eight hours, I'm just looking at the window, the wind is crazy. Sorry, I got distracted. You want to figure out what north, east, west, and south is. So your sun's going to spend most of the time in the southern sky moving to the west. And so if your sun, say, like right here for the, the meantime, and you have you want to want to plant your tall plants here, like plants, because the sun's going to hit them and cast shade across all of these. So you want to plant your taller plants in the back so the shade gets cast into um, your walking space and stuff like that. So it might be like um, tomatoes, peppers, and then squash. So you want to pay attention to when your plants get tall, wherever the sun is sitting for the afternoon, that the shade from those bigger plants isn't falling onto your smaller plants or they're not going to get enough sun. And all these things that I talked about are, you know, pieces that help you kind of figure out where do I want to put my garden? So with all that being said, I will stay on for the next 15 minutes, answer any questions you guys have on vegetable gardening. Um, I'll take priority in case there's a lot, but I don't think there'll be that many, you know, for this round um, on your first vegetable garden. Sylvia, so, I mean, I saw that you you have plants that are dying that you're trying to grow as seedlings indoors. Um, uh, if you check out the video description, I have a lot on starting indoors. You want to make sure you're starting under grow lights. Um, it's possible you have really intense lights and they start growing and the lights dry out or burn the plants and they die off. So you want to raise your lights a little bit. Um, I don't think you're overwatering at this point, but prolonged soaking seed starting mix can also kill off your plants. Um, if you didn't use a sterile starting mix, sometimes, and you would see this white fuzz around the base of your seedlings, that's damping off disease. I don't think it's that. But I would just try and change up a little bit of what you're doing um, and you know see what changes happen from there. April, have you heard Beat Your Neighbor Fertilizer? I haven't. Um, it's a cool name. 
Sharky's grown house. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is, but one of the things I was saying earlier is it's not the packaging. Never get fooled. Like Dr. Earth, a lot of you see that in the big box stores. That is so crazily expensive. Um, it actually makes me angry. Like, I'm like, why are you selling this? If you go to Espoma, their products are cheaper per pound. They're just good. One isn't necessarily better than the other because it's not the packaging. It's the ingredients. And the main ingredients come first. So you're going to see usually chicken manure, which they'll call maybe chicken meal, um, feathers, which I'll call feather meal, bone meal, which is ground up cattle bone, which I'll call bone meal, and blood meal, which is dried pig blood, basically. And that's what makes your organic fertilizers. And sometimes they throw in other stuff, cotton seed, alfalfa, et cetera. But when you get further down the ingredient list, there's less of that in there. Plants don't care what form. That's why I'm not against the chemical type fertilizers. They don't care what form the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And then you also have magnesium, um, calcium, and sulfur and micronutrients. They don't care what form it comes in. The chemical fertilizers, this is why my issue is with it. It's in a water-soluble form. They're just boosting your plants. Organic, organic water-soluble, chemical water-soluble aren't going to strengthen really your garden soil in any way. That's why you have to add compost and organic matter. And it's the organic matter and compost that create a thriving, more organic garden than, you know, those products. All right. Over the weekend, I see some of my winter sowing plants are sprouting. It's getting cold again. Will it be a problem? Chamomile, dill, thyme, onions, and parsley have sprouted. So the dill might be a problem because they can take some cold. Just depends on the frost and the freeze that comes. Chamomile should be okay. Onions will be okay. Thyme will be okay. Parsley will be okay. That being said, they just sprouted, so they're still growing the roots in. I mean, it's possible since they just sprouted, the freeze comes and it's really intense and it lasts for days. It could kill them off. But if it's just your normal temperatures, um, most of them should be okay. And winter sowing, for people that don't know that, that's taking um, a milk jug. Well, I have, actually have one here. So I was doing a class on this. This is a milk jug. It's a half a gallon. Fill it with the starting mix. Poke a hole in it. Put your onion seeds in there. Close it up. Water it in. Put it outside. And when the temperatures get right, your onions will sprout. And then you can take them and use them as transplants. And that's winter sowing. Yeah, so any fertilizer... On sale is a good deal, <laughs> for sure. So if you buy the green stock, it's on sale now. If you use my code, actually, the rusted garden, um, I'll put it in there. It will save you ten dollars anytime you buy a green stock product. I have a bunch of them. I've been with them for eight years. I love them. Everything grows well in it. You can't grow well squash and zucchini because you only get seven or eight gallons per tier um you could do dwarf stuff like that but i've seriously i've grown all the greens kale um stuff like you know you could put onions in there but you don't have a lot of space in the pocket um collards grow well spinach grows well lettuce grows well peppers grow well dwarf tomatoes determinate tomatoes grow well all kinds of flowers i have stuff i have them set up growing strawberries everywhere i use them as my strawberry towers uh, bush beans do well. Um, you know, a lot grows in there. So, and I'll be doing videos on that on this channel, teaching people how to grow in vertical towers um, and how to grow in containers. So, the green stalk, I mean, green stalk gets water from the top and you do fill it. I find those sometimes because I'm watering by a hose, even in my large garden, I sometimes just hit each tier and I just you know, do like 10 seconds in a pocket. It floods the whole thing. They drain out to the bottom. So they drain to the other ones. I just hit the tears real quick. Um, during like April, May, I usually water from the top, maybe beginning of June. But once the heat comes and my plants are bigger, you have to water them more often. And that's not because 
green stock made a bad product. Any container or vertical tower system, when your plants are large and it's summer and it's hot, they can just suck the water out of there in a day. So you have to keep up on it depending on what you're growing. And I don't know if I answered your question, but I do, I do water it more often as we get into late June, July, and the beginning of August because the plants are big and it's really, it's really hot out. All right, seven more minutes to go. If I missed your question, please um, throw it out there again. Do you have a greenhouse? Can you talk about greenhouses and are they helpful to a gardener? So there's a lot of kind of, there are a lot of different greenhouses. So <clears throat> you can buy a greenhouse and you can put it like on a concrete flat. You can have it set up that you're going to be growing in there all year long, have a heating system and you, and sometimes people put it just over earth and they're growing in the earth around the greenhouse too. So it depends on what you want to do with it. If you're trying to grow into the freezing temperatures, you need a different design with your greenhouse. My greenhouse is just for seed starting and for growing when it's warmer. So I have some plants out there now, um, perennial herbs, some flowers. I have a small heater in there that kicks on at 38 degrees. I'm just trying to keep the greenhouse from freezing. It's a small footprint, maybe 10 by 12. And I use it mainly for starting seeds and it's going to work beautifully for that. I just put, I just built it actually from a kit late last year. I grow a lot of stuff indoors. This stuff will get transferred into the greenhouse. So I'm using a greenhouse as a way to help me grow my transplants. So they're helpful in many ways. You just have to, um, you know, decide what you want to get out of it. So, yeah. And then, Chicken Mama says green stock comes with a spinner. It sits on there and it's beautiful. It's really well made and you can just rotate your towers. So if you're growing, say, on a deck or in a space that gets um, it's just crowded, you know, and the one side is facing north. Every couple of days, you turn your tower a couple of feet and you rotate that tower around on the spinner and then the whole tower gets plenty of light. Do you leave mold breakdown and look? Um, do leave, I'm going to read it as it's written. Do leave mold breakdown and look like soil when it's ready to be used? Mine is going for over a year now and I can still see smaller leaves. So, so you're talking about leaf mold. So when my leaf mold at a year, it's pretty well broken down and you pick it up and it's these little particles at two years, it, it's just these really fine particles. It's really good stuff. Your stuff is probably getting there. You could still use it, but if you can see bits of leaves, um, one thing you want to be keeping in mind is, is it in a place where worms can get to it? And is it drying out too much? You always want your leaf mold to be a little bit moist. And you, if you're doing it in a container, you want to make sure worms can crawl into it from the bottom in some capacity. But it sounds like it's getting close to being used. So that's a good question, and we'll probably, well, we're going to wrap up in the next four or five minutes. So there is benefit to companion planting, um, but it's not so cut and dry. If you put basil with tomatoes, certain insects find plants based on flower color. You know, they just hone in on that big yellow flower from your zucchini plant, and bees do that. They figure out how to pollinate. Maybe the tomato hornworm can smell the tomato plant. Or when you break a leaf of a cucumber plant or a tomato plant, you can smell the plant. Insects come to that. When you mix in stuff that has a stronger scent like basil and mint and garlic, sometimes it masks the scents of the plants and that reduces bad insect pressure. But there's no foolproof way to plant companion plants and then have this perfect garden. If there were, we would all know about it and... It would not be a secret. But marigolds, uh, the French marigolds, it smell more, not some of the modern marigolds that had that leafy smell removed. You know, problems from coming in. But, you know, weirdly enough, some people think mint helps get rid of aphids. Well, I've had aphids attack my mints before. Um, last year, I planted garlic all over the place. Um, I didn't get any tomato hornworms. However, 
rarely do I get hornworms. Um, I've had them. They can be, you know, pretty devastating. So it's all about learning. I would go ahead and do that because you can maximize, you know, the basil with the tomatoes. You pick some tomatoes, you pick some basil. Maybe it's not doing anything for keeping the horn, hornworm away, but you're maximizing your space and your harvest. Um, your garlic leaves right now, you're in New Jersey, so you're pretty close. Because they're still frost and they're still freeze, all that green growth above, just let it be. Don't, don't worry about it. That's going to get beat up. It could even die off. All you want to make sure, and it's if it's growing, it's fine, is the root system is setting up. The clove is good in the ground. And soon as the frost goes away, the warm weather comes, all this new greenery is going to come up and your garlic will be fine. All right, so we're going to wrap up here. Please subscribe. I will be doing this live series, very specific topic, very detailed, with the assumption that the people that are signing on are brand new to gardening, and I will take your questions. And again, check out the video description. There's a bunch of videos in there that will teach you how to grow your plants indoors. Thanks so much. This was fun. This was the first event. There will be more. It's not going to be on the schedule, like I said, because I'm squeezing these in where they fit into my schedule. Um, so I will see you guys next time. Take care.